Hi. Okay, we're still looking at the principle-based versus rules-based uh, approaches of corporate governance, and we left the last chapter looking at uh, this area. We're now going to look at uh, the, uh, carry on with this conversation. So, UK Corporate Governance Code is a good example of a principles-based approach, as opposed to Sarbanes Oxley in America, which is a rules-based approach. Now, the thing here is to sort of remember lists, unfortunately, of certain things. So, principle-based approach, it allows common sense judgment, arguably, whereas rules-based approach, you could say, well, it's clear and unambiguous. The rule is the rule is the rule, so therefore it's not unambiguous. In a, it's also an environment where directors are often criticised. It's fair to directors to give clear rules for them to follow. So therefore, directors perhaps feel better off in a rules-based approach because they know what the guidelines are, what the rules are. They can work within them. There is clarity and consistency between companies. The fact there's a lack of exemptions via complier explained, which is what happens in principles, it gives perhaps greater confidence in that compliance. So those are the advantages of uh, a rules-based approach. Having said all that, if you have a principle-based approach, it does leave your stakeholders to assess if non-compliance with every rule is a problem or not. So the fact the CEO and C and chairman are the same person, and then you get told that why, maybe you can work out it's not such a bad thing. It does allow flexibility between companies, so companies which are different assess their own business specific risks accordingly and react accordingly. When you get lists of rules, it's unlikely you will anticipate every possible outcome. So what happens when a rule doesn't exist for a particular situation? A rules-based approach therefore falls down, whereas perhaps with a principle-based approach where you have just guidelines, you can perhaps work within that guideline to solve that, that particular issues. Rules-based compliance becomes a form of bureaucratic, bureaucratic filing exercise. You know, it becomes just check a box, check a check a list, make sure you complied with it. So, com principle based compliance therefore requires companies to think and analyse their own risks. It's not such a ticking and bashing exercise. Perhaps there's a wastage of resources when you have a rules based approach, which is a, you know trying to trying to comply can be quite expensive and onerous. When doing a principle-based approach, you just have to comply with the spirit of the law rather than the minutiae of the wording of a rules-based approach. So again, another, another advantage. Okay, changing the tack now, we're going to look at risk management and internal control. What's key in this is two things. First of all, risk can be a good thing in business. Do not say in the exam that risk must be eliminated. The other important thing is that risk will never be eliminated entirely. It's just not possible. So you have to accept that risk will always exist. It's just a case of trying to perhaps mi minimise it or accept a risk for a certain value that you believe you can get as a return. This is the process of risk management. Now there are a couple of approaches. There's the Turnbull report, now part of the Corporate Governance Code, and the COSO, Committee of Sponsoring Organisations Framework. The COSO framework provides a good system for tackling questions in the exam as it takes a step-by-step -step approach. If you want to see more, there's a website where you can go and have a look at online. The COSO cube, as it's called, di di indicates how enterprise management is something that ought to pervade the entire organisation. It has eight steps in risk management, which should auto happen automatically all around the company. OK, let's go and have a look at those eight steps. Here they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are the eight areas you should be looking at for risk management. 
I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to highlight the eight and just suggest you read through these at your own leisure. They're not particularly difficult, but they are there. And it's, it is a list that you do need to think about learning as part of the COSO cube. Okay, but if you remember that risks, never say risks are bad and never say risks will be limit, eliminated entirely because you can't. All you can do is mitigate, diminish risk relative towards the return you're going to get. Okay. So there's your your eight. Risk responses now. Just to draw it up a little bit here. If you think that an event has a low chance of happening and has a low impact on the business, then you're in the world of, well, it's not a worry, I'll accept it. However, if it's low but high business impact, then you would try and get rid of that risk, you would transfer it. High and low, reduce, high impact, high probability, you would avoid it. No point taking that on at all. Now you may therefore see this is the Tara principle, that mnemonic, okay? That's what that's about. Important to state the facts of the case and how you're gonna apply that theory to situations. So read the scenario, see what it says and then apply it. I'll give an example. Risk are avoided are ones that the entity manager wants to remove or manage to reduce. Okay. Risk manager, well, it's just basically it's somebody who has a full-time employee, probably not a director, who reports to the audit committee of the board. They need to identify and manage risk as well as ensure that risk awareness is embedded in the corporate culture at all, all levels. Types of business risk, it's a nice list to try and learn off by heart. It does come up, sometimes you could be asked what is market risk, what is reputation risk, I've seen that in an exam. You just need to learn the definitions which I won't go through, they're there on the screen and not particularly difficult to understand. Types of controls, well you've got corporate controls which are general policy statements, established core culture and overall monitoring procedures, corporate governance, there's management controls, planning performance, business process controls and finally transaction controls including which will ac test for accuracy and completeness checks. You've also got the mnemonic SOAP span, which you might remember from your accounting studies, and those lovely few uh, internal controls that you need to probably again learn by heart. Okay, quickly now just move on to professional values and ethics just to start you off. It will feature in the exam, probably as part of a case study, possibly as a standalone question. You will not be asked your own ethical views on something. What you're doing is you'll be giving a case story about somebody else's views and you've got to work out probably where they are in the theories and apply some knowledge to that scenario. What you sometimes do will compare and contrast views of different people and which should they go for. You'll probably be asked to define these terms and use them to categorise or explain the views of a person in a case study, as I say. Okay, so that's professional values and ethics. More on that in the next recording. I'll end this one now.